So if I go to a restaurant and they have fettuccine Alfredo, oh, yeah. I know that's probably going to be safe. It's maybe if, if there's like a little plasticky something in the sauce, like it might be a no, but it's a safe food. I know what I can order. There are foods that are safe and there are foods that are unsafe. I'm not just like being picky. It's not happening. Welcome to the Autistic Culture Podcast. Each episode, we dive deep into autistic contributions to society and culture by introducing you to some of the world's most famous and successful autistics in history. Before we get started, a quick disclaimer on how we use the word autistic. The purpose of this show is not to diagnose the people or characters we discuss as autistic. While some may have announced being autistic, what we're sharing here is our observation of what is representative of autistic culture. It can sometimes be difficult for autistic people to celebrate our natural tendencies and traits due to the perception of autism as a disorder that needs to be fixed, a long history of damaging medical interventions to try and get us to fit in with mainstream culture, and protective masking skills many of us have developed to try to stay safe. Whether you are autistic or just love someone who is, your host is Dr. Angela Loria, the linguistic autistic, and licensed psychological practitioner Matt Lowry welcome you to take this time to be fully immersed in the language, values, traditions, norms, and identity of Autistica. Autistica. Episode 21, Dino Nuggets are Autistic. I'm very much looking forward to this episode. I like this. <sighs> well, I'm Matt, excited. <laughs> well, Matt, you say that uh, in autistic life, it's about friends, family, and fictional characters. Do dino nuggets count as a fictional character? Uh, well, they, they count as two Fs, friends and food. There we go. Um, dino nuggets are definitely my friend. And today, Matt, you and I are going to be talking about autistic food culture. Oh, yes. I look forward to this. So Italians have their cannolis, the French have their croissants, British people have chicken tikka, which, okay, that's Indian culture, but it is the official English national dish, chicken tikka masala. And really? it is a great example of how one subculture's traditions get shared across subcultures. And today we are going to talk about how autistic culture brings simple pleasures to the world and some of the classics of autistic food culture. So um, before we dive into the material I have prepared for you today, would you like to share any of your favorite foods? Turkey sandwiches with uh, Hillshire Farm oven baked turkey, craft processed cheese, uh, butternut bread. That That is a, a meal I can eat too eight times a day. Uh, 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 let's uh, Chicken nuggets, of course. I've got a bag of chicken nuggets in my uh, freezer. I, I love uh, chicken sandwiches from Wendy's. I love chicken sandwiches from Arby's. I love chicken sandwiches from McDonald's. I am, I am a firm believer that the chicken evolved from the T-Rex and it would eat me and my family if given the chance. So it is my duty to keep them from ever turning back into T-Rexes by eating as many as possible of them. I am. That sounds very scientific. We believe very, in science here. In this very show. sciencey. <clears throat> well, you've already tipped on one thing I wanted to talk about today, and that is how brands are really important to us. And not, I mean, it could be a store brand. It's not about like the. I'm going to show a bougie brand right now. If you're watching the video, I'm holding up my Fiji water. Um, so uh, a lot of people of all brain types talk about, oh, it's hard to get your water in. I always had trouble drinking water until I found Fiji water. And now I just buy a case of Fiji water a week. I have no trouble drinking water, but it must be Fiji water. So I always have it in my car. I have it anywhere. It is the only water I can drink. Water tastes so different to me. Water from a tap, water poured at the restaurant, water from Deer Park. It's not for me. Deer Park, that's not good water for me. Um, it tastes plasticky. 
It tastes very plasticky to me. So, yeah. and like you mentioned, I forget the first one that you said. It was a certain kind. Was it? Was oh, it the, um, the turkey or the? Yeah, the you named yeah. a brand yeah. right yeah. off Hillshire the Farm. Hillshire yeah. Farms. It's weird. Other people say I want a turkey sandwich. You're like I want a Hillshire Farms chicken uh, turkey sandwich. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anything else is completely inedible. I can't do that. Right. So it's not like I like turkey, but Hillshire Farms, like, there you go. Um, There was a TikTok that I watched uh, preparing for this episode, and the guy was talking about how he eats ground turkey, but it has to be Butterball 93.7. So not just Butterball, but 93% lean, 7% fat. Interesting uh, ratio. Yeah, I know. I was like, very, it, it's not like hyper lean by any means, Butterball 93.7. So there's probably not every store that's going to carry your Butterball 93.7 uh, ground meat, but you are going to find that store and commit. And um, I, first of all, just think it is so, I, like, so clear the difference between, I don't know, 93 versus 98, whatever the more common options are, or Hillshire Farms versus whatever they have at Subway. Um, those different, certainly for me, Deer Park versus Fiji, like one is completely un, not an option, undrinkable. Yes. And one I can drink all day. I drink all day. I just drink yeah. Fiji water all day. And like, I know it's maybe there are issues, plastic water bottle. I got, I got all the messages, but I also know I would like to drink water. So, yeah. um, I, so I, cannot, I cannot drink water unless it's uh, filtered through my pure water filters. And I've got four water filters. So I will never, ever be without water ever because right. uh, I was once without water. And I was like, oh, my God, it was during the pandemic and I couldn't just run out because my son wouldn't wear a mask. So I went with I had to drink tap water and I was horrified. So now I have four water filters with fresh filters all the time. So I've always got a steady source of water as if it's a mountain stream just sitting there. Yes, right here. Amazon yeah. subscribe and save. Thank exactly. you very much. Oh yes, it made for autistic people. I've yes. got, I got PG water. I got my dance cookies. I got all the, uh, all the subscribe and saves you could there, ever want. There is a specific uh, cookie that I will not mention because I don't want it to ever run out. That my oh. son, that is my son's favorite cookie of all time. He will not eat any other cookie but this cookie. So uh, I order cases of this cookie so he will always have his cookies. Right. Cases. It's important. When yes. my when my kid was a baby, there were these crackers that had just come out. They're kind of like a rice cracker. They're like crispy, but they also sort of melt or dissolve in your mouth. They're they're Ooh. called mum mums, something like that. Oh. And um, I don't think my kid even like them, but I ended up buying cases of the mum mums pretending they were for my baby. They were really all for me. I would always have them in the diaper bag. Those are my mum mums, like baby oh, yeah. food. Yes, please. Exactly. This is the way. Mm. So I just want to say all autistic people are not the same. There are definitely Italians who don't eat cannolis, and I'm sure there are French people who hate croissants. What is wrong with them? I'm not sure. Uh, Plenty of autistic people who feel the opposite of what we are going to explore with autistic culture today. And that is a part of um, the hyperconnected brain. So it often goes the opposite way. So Matt, I'm going to give you a little quote here to read with us. Oh, that's a good one. Other autistic people, including me, add to the astringency, pungency, or acidity of their food, often doubling or tripling the amount of garlic, onions, or chilies in a dish. Jonathan Katz in Flavors of Diaspora. Yeah. Okay. yeah, there's really no human limit to the amount of garlic that one can consume in one setting because I've tried. Mm. Well, you and Jonathan Katz can keep your garlic. Today I will be celebrating ah. the bland food side of the spectrum. <laughs> Um, the, but it is really important to understand this. Like when we talk about artistic culture, nothing we talk about applies to every single person, just like in any culture, subculture, everyone does not like all the same thing. We are not monoliths. 
Um, and so don't send us hate mail. I, and I get a, it. There's a lot of autistic people who stim through food and seek out new flavors and new textures because that's how they stim. Right. And it's sensor, sensory seeking. Do you want to talk about sensory seeking and what's the other side of it? It's the uh, one I am. Yeah. Sensory seeking and sensory avoidant because that's me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because uh, there are people that, for instance, like with sounds, you might really, really like music and like you might be the autistic person who is, sits in your car and blasts hardcore death metal at ear splitting levels, but you can't handle multiple conversations at the same time. So they're like that. There are also people who can't stand the, you know, to not have that kind of water, but really, really need to taste all kinds of new different foods. Uh, right. There might be a time when you, you need a safe food because you say, oh, well, the snails just didn't work out and I can't eat anything else. So I need my safe food. Right. And we are going to talk about safe foods today for sure. Um, I, I would like to feature in this episode, the joys of buttered noodles, grilled cheese, mac and cheese, McDonald's, chicken nuggets, dino nuggets, chicken nuggets shaped like dinosaurs. Um, or as my, my husband calls chicken nugget nuggets, it's my favorite boneless wings. Oh, I'm like, you all know that's a chicken nugget, right? But okay. I'm happy to pretend. Uh, but that's a chicken nugget. I need to share a picture of uh, my 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 autism comes from my mother's family. And looking back on it, I found a picture of my family at Easter gathered around the traditional Throckmorton McNugget platter. And in making a thanks, in, 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 or the, the the traditional Easter th uh, McNugget platter, and they they literally went out and got. Lots and lots and lots of boxes of Nick Nuggets, put them on a platter, arranged with sauces around it. That was normal for my family. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, through the autism lens, you say, yeah. But did you never get the, like, you'll sit here and finish this meal? Oh, God, Like, no. none no. of that. No, no. We, mm. we had chicken nuggets and lots of bread. <laughs> mm. Yeah, that's me. Bread, cheese, chicken nuggets, <laughs> I'm good. Like, that's all I need. But the you have to finish your plate, clean plate club. Anyway, we'll get to more of that later. But I want to start with our good friends at Autistics United Canada to put Ooh. this in, uh, put this whole show in context. So read this quote for us, Matt. Every culture in the world recognizes the healing power of food, the confidence and optimism for the day you feel when you eat for the day you feel when you eat a breakfast full of nutrients, uh, the emotional healing that is a bowl of ice cream after a bad day brings you, families growing their connections to each other by eating dinner at the table together, the comfort of your favorite meal cooked by your mom. There is nothing in the world so disastrous to a person that good food cannot help you heal from. If only just give you a temporary break from all your other stimulus. Autistics have a very special connection with food. We develop personal relationships with it. Our favorite foods are not just comforting to us. They are as important to us as every other comfort item we fall back into when our world becomes too overstimulating. Our favorite foods are our stability and our safety. Autistic culture has coined two terms to describe our relationships with our favorite food. Safe food and same food. Safe food is a food that brings in joy, comfort, and peace when we get it. Same food is a food that we have grown so attached to we can do or eat it. We can or do eat it every day. It is very normal for safe food to also be same food. Right. On Parks and Recreation, uh, Ron Swanson once said, there is no sadness on earth that breakfast food, that breakfast food can't cure. I'm in the breakfast food club for sure. So I want to contrast same food and safe food, which, uh, as that quote points out, they they can be the same thing. They aren't always. And we'll talk about some of those differences. But with the message I got growing up, which I think you didn't get, and I'm very jealous. I would like to like trade you some of my trauma. <laughs> Um, but <laughs> I was described as a picky eater. I was yeah. too. 
Yeah, yeah. But in a in a traumatizing way though, or no? You were just like uh, in a family of like we're picky eaters. My father did not like uh my diet. My father mm. uh, for instance so from the age of uh from kindergarten through high school, uh my mother got up every day and uh put a uh, jar of Campbell's vegetable beef soup into a thermos for me, added crackers, and that was my lunch. Every day for what nine or oh, what ninth grade? So yeah, every day for like five years. Right, same yeah. food. Yeah, mm. every single day. My father hated it. My father did not like that. I did not like. Mine catfish. was the the Campbell's chunky Salisbury steak. Ooh, ooh, that's a good one. Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's consistent. You know what you're getting when you get that can. Yeah, it, it's sealed in a can. You know how much you're getting. You know what you're getting. You know it's going to be the same. You know it's going to be good. You know it will be an acceptable meal. Right. And like, it's not that we don't need to eat, but there are, at least for me, if given the choice between eating something that I have an aversion to and not eating, I will often pick not eating. Like, it's not even... Yeah. Like I was saying about that Deer Park water, like it's just not even an option. I mean, I guess if I was like parched in the desert, maybe I'd have a sip, but like not even really. Well, that's the thing. We don't interpret it as food. It's like trying to offer us gravel. We we don't want yes. that. Yeah. So when I would get like described as picky in every meal, there would be drama around. First of all, I, I got into a like, Hoarding food, secret oh, eating. Yeah. Cause if I knew there were like there was something in the house that I would eat, mm -hmm. then I would eat all of it because who knows when I'm gonna get food again, or I would take it to my room and I would hide it. Yeah. To make sure I could have it. And then that would be the thing that sent my dad over the edge was like hiding food. Yeah. Um, Neurotypicals hate that. They'd really hate that. Yeah. And then I was also overweight and I'm not, and most of my like safe foods were not on my dad's list of things a fat girl should be eating. Yeah. Like have an apple or something. I'm not sure. They were not on the list. Although weirdly, one of my, um, one of my safe foods was uh, green bell peppers. Ooh, I oh, I like green bell peppers. I think yes. I probably ate 3,000 bell peppers before I turned 10. And now I can't even be in the same room with them. Like it never Ooh. circled back around again. I just finished. And I find with a lot of my same foods, like all I wanted to eat was green bell peppers for like years and years and years. And then one day it's done. Yeah. The yesterday was my favorite thing. My mom bought me 15 green bell peppers yesterday. Today I wake up. It's over. We have completed the green bell pepper cycle. And my mom's like, why are you wasting these bell peppers? They are not an option. I cannot choke them down. And this makes no sense because yesterday I wanted 400. Yeah. Yeah. Because you, you got your fill and it took 400 of them to fill. But yeah, that's that's the way it is. OK, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. We love sharing stories of autistic culture. And if you are seeing yourself in any of these stories and you're wondering if maybe you're one of us or maybe you're already diagnosed or self-diagnosed and you wanna know if Matt can help you live your life better and be more authentically autistic, check out his website at mattlowerylpp.com. That's Matt, M-A-T-T, -T, Lowry, L-O-W-R-Y. And then that L-P-P, -P, it stands for Licensed Psychological Practitioner. So head on over to MattLowryLPP.com and learn more about working with my buddy, Matt. So the pickiness for me, um, I have four categories. Let's see if you have any others. Um, so I have temperature issues and oh, yeah. I can eat hot food and I can eat cold food, but some food should be hot and some food should be cold. Um, for instance, my husband makes these incredible British pies and thinks they are okay to take out of the fridge and eat cold. That is incorrect. That is a hot food and must be cooked. Yeah. He also puts chocolate in the fridge. And Why? that is not where chocolate goes. He always wants his chocolate frozen because it something snaps. Yeah, but it's that's not the wrong. texture of chocolate. It's just it needs to be wrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not okay with me. So 
if I have the exact same food that I love, but it is at the wrong temperature, hard pass. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm going to, oh, I have two. Ah, they're all so good. Okay, the next one is texture. Ah, yes. Texture, my friend, texture. Absolutely. I, don't care if you made oysters out of chocolate. It's just never happening. I do nope. not want slimy food. No, no, I will not do slimy. I have been asked to do slimy. I, it will not happen. Nope. Not even for our anniversary. Not even if you love me. And if I love you, if you made it for me. There are certain textures that are not happening. I have a little issue with the gelatinous substance in a tomato. Yeah, yeah. Whatever yeah. that little yeah, I don't know is. what it's called, but I definitely know because it's awkward. Nope, not for me. Not gonna yeah. happen. Uh, flavors. So I mentioned that I am not a sensory seeker, so I am very committed to anything beige. If it is beige, it is safe. I will do a banana. I will do mashed potatoes. Give me vanilla ice cream. Bring on the beige foods. My standard statement is cornflakes are the spiciest food I will ever need. I, I am totally in the Samwise Gamgee uh, category when it comes to potatoes. I will eat any and all forms of potato because that that is the way to go. I'll, I'll sit and eat a raw potato like an apple. Oh, that I haven't done, but I'm open to it. I, oh, yeah, I, yeah. It's got a great crisp enough. texture but to it. I'm sensing the crunch in my mind right now. Um, and that I talked about the aversion on textures, but we as a culture have introduced a lot of crunch to this planet, my friend. Yes, yes. We are a pro-crunch culture. I So Alton Brown did this uh, series called Good Eats for years and years and years. And I was unaware of the joys of the sandwich until he started talking about how you can layer on these different textures and combine these because if you have like a different texture of bread and cheese and sauce and like lettuce or whatever, because if you have these multiple different layers in the right way, if you put them on the wrong way, it's sensory hell. But if you put them on the right way, it's a, 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 a symphony of textures, not just flavors, but of textures. And oh my God, that's the way. And this is why I only cook fried chicken the way that I do, because you, you get it in a certain way with a certain crispness of the coating. And you, if you don't do that, I can't eat it. Uh, I, right. I can't eat Chick-fil-A. I, I, Chick-fil-A is flaccid. I can't do Chick Fil A. I well, can't luckily deal with the we don't want to give them our money anyway. So exactly, that works out yeah. perfectly. Yeah, give your money to McDonald's. I'm sure they're very nice people there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, okay, my last category. So we've talked about flavor. We've talked about texture, temperature. I'm gonna add social justice issues. In oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's, that's a great segue from, uh, you know, the, the, the people who hate everyone. Mm -hmm. yeah, yes. Yeah, the people, yeah. The, yeah. Chick -fil -A the, and yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, but may, maybe I'm averse to Chick-fil-A because they hate everyone. But, um, but meat in general, I was a vegetarian from 1990 to 2008. Yes. And I still won't cook meat and there's very selective meat I will have. And honestly, even with chicken nuggets, if given the option between fake chicken McNuggets and real ones, I will just default to the fake ones. If I think about meat at all, so like I can't be in the kitchen really when it's being cooked. I could like be in the room, but I can't be like hovering over it. I definitely am not touching meat. That is not what's going to happen. Um, I mean, I'll cut, touch it after it's cooked, but like raw meat, not happening. Yeah, yeah and, I'm, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna touch it, especially if it's in animal form. I'll, I'll go right. for. I'll go for an Impossible Whopper. Those things are actually really good. Mm. They taste like real Whoppers. Yes, and also a uh, little hat tip to Starbucks: the Impossible Breakfast Sandwich at Starbucks. So good. It's like a sausage affair, sausage, egg, and cheese, but with Impossible sausage. I like that. Big fan. I also like an Impossible Whopper. I am with oh. you on that. Oh, absolutely. So uh, so those are my four categories that um, 
that cause uh, that cause uh, autistic food culture to create some very interesting uh, experiences in the world. Sabrina is a moderator moderator of a Tumblr called Autism Asks, and this is what she said when when answering the question, "Why are autistic people so unique about their food choices?" I'm not sure if we have an answer for why we do this. However, in my experience, same fooding is very different from picky eating. Picky eating is about what you won't eat. For autistic people, this is often related to sensory sensitivities or to taste or texture. Same fooding, on the other hand, is closer to a special interest. When I have a same food, chocolate ice cream currently, I really, really want that food. I can eat that food endlessly and not get tired of it. I will get upset if I'm not able to have the food in a day. For me, it is usually the kind of routine based as well. For instance, with my current same food, I have some in the evenings and it's become part of how I wind down for my day. Another way to think of it is like craving a craving that just keeps happening. Sabrina, moderator of Autism Asks Tumblr. So I read this and I was like, oh, that's very interesting because safe foods for me are foods I'll eat. So if I go to a restaurant and they have fettuccine Alfredo, I know that's probably going to be safe. It's maybe if if there's like a little plasticky something in the sauce, like it might be a no, but it's a safe food. I know what I can order. Grilled cheese you know, like a chicken sandwich at a fast food restaurant. So when I go out, there's safe foods. Same foods have a comfort factor to them, a routine factor to them. They're doing something slightly different. My, right now, my same, right now, right now for the last three years, my same food is um, <laughs> Sa- Safeway brand uh, ice cream sandwiches. Oh, oh, and- yeah. At the end of every day, I have a Safeway brand ice cream sandwich, and it's how I know my day is over. So I saw this quote, and I was like, that's why I do that. It's like, I I don't know. It's doing a fit. Plus, it is a safe food, Yeah, but it's doing a thing. Yeah. Uh, I've got baked ruffles currently, and I have to – my son also likes the baked ruffles, so I buy them by the case so that we always have baked ruffles around because – that's that after a busy day, that's what I want to shove in my face because it, it's got the salt. It's got the texture. It doesn't have the grease because I can't do the grease. So, yeah, it. it I do bake, too. I'm a baked Lay's person. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There you go. I feel you on the ruffle. I'm cool with the ruffles. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I thought this was a cool way to look at safe foods versus same foods. Mm-hmm. And then also looking at the idea of picky, which yes. is like turning my nose up at something as opposed to it's just not on the table. There are foods that are safe and there are foods that are unsafe. I'm not just like being picky. It's not happening. Well, isn't that like an evolutionary thing? Because, you know, there are some things that if we ate it, we would die. Uh, that, That seems like an evolutionary advantage to me to be a picky eater so you don't accidentally eat poison. Yes. And there is a similar thing on, you know, how I was talking about how I was like hyper-focused on bell peppers and then I was done. Yes. There's a thing, there's a theory that this is evolutionary. So I don't know if this is true, but let me throw this theory out at you. The idea is that like we're in a hunter gatherer society and right now the blueberries are fresh. So we're going to eat all the blueberries because they're going to run out. And right now we have blueberries. Eat them, eat them, eat them. And then there's a day where the blueberries start to like get mushy, taste weird. We know they're going bad. They're maybe getting fungus on the vine. And we immediately stop eating the blueberries. They are not in season. I like that. Everybody sort of had a safe food. It was what was in season. And it was also your same food for the season. You would get hyper fixated on that food while we have it. And then it wasn't blueberries anymore. Now it's corn. Let's hyper fixate on corn because we we don't have a grocery store. We don't have 5,000 cereal boxes to choose from. We're just going to eat the corn. Yeah, I, I think it fits. I like that explanation. Yeah. 
I got another one for you. This is, and I'm going to put this one in the show notes. I don't know if you know about this one. This is the TAS R38 genotype, which is the super taster gene. Ooh, I like that. Mm -hmm. So there are tests for this. And I was always called a picky eater. I was super traumatized by being a picky eater, developed into eating disorders. And then I found, I don't know, in some magazine TV show somewhere, I read this article about super tasters. And I think it was an article about cilantro. Yeah. I, f I forget. Are you pro or anti on the cilantro I thing? Honestly, I don't know because I know that some people think it tastes like soap. Soap. But I don't I don't know if I've had experience with it that are you would know. memorable. Yeah. Yeah, you would know. You may not have the TASR thirty eight genotype. Yeah. Um, which if you if you know you have the cilantro version and there are other things that often go with it, for instance, like Brussels sprouts, it's a highly acute sense of bitter. So I read this story about cilantro, about the genotype, and there are these little test strips. They're like little white, like you would get um, in science class if you were testing, I don't know, capillary action or something, diffusion. Um, there are these little test strips, and you put them on your tongue. And my partner at the time, I got the test strips and she was the one who, when I did my autism test and I like scored, I don't know, 80%, 86% on the test. And I was sure her score would be similar. And she was like 5%, like not at all autistic. We did the same thing with our super taster tests. I put one on my tongue for a 10th of a second and it felt like a thousand elves were trying to murder my face with small pickaxes, she couldn't taste anything, put it in her mouth, chewed it, crunched it, sucked it. She was like desperately trying to taste anything and could taste nothing. That and then we did it, on, I, like I split a strip, like I gave her two different strips. I'm like, maybe you got one without the solution on it. So we took one strip and split it, like I tasted her strip and gave it, to, like she could, nothing, nothing there at all. Wow. And that's, it uh. is a totally different experience. And I'm like, what do you experience a hamburger like? Yeah. Like, well, it must be a very different experience than my eating experience, which is why I'm very satisfied with cornflakes and yeah. do not need to put sriracha on them. <laughs> ah! and, and that goes back to like the intense world theory with our hyper senses and stuff, because... Yeah, if uh, if you're overwhelmed by taste, then you're going to want to seek out something that doesn't consistently punch you in the face. See, see how that works. Yeah, is, yeah, I like again, that. Again, science. Um, there's a, a common belief, and in fact, um, this was something Mila and I raised our kids together. And her rule for her daughter is: when I cook you something, you have to finish it. And if you don't finish it at dinner, you'll stay up until bedtime looking at the plate. And then in the morning, that will be the only thing you can eat until you eat it. So like you Ouch. can eventually eat something else, but only after you finish this plate. Not surprisingly, I did not have this rule for my child. <laughs> I don't blame so, you. So, yes. So the idea that what Mila would try and tell me was like, when she gets hungry enough and when she wants her whatever pancakes for breakfast enough, uh, she will eventually eat this. It's sort of like if I'm in the desert and all I have is Deer Park water, you will eventually eat the Deer Park water. And what I want her to learn and value as a human is not wasting food. Like food is expensive. We spend a lot of money on this food. I don't want her to think wasting it is an option. And there, this is not crazy, I guess. But like it's there's also, no logic yeah. to it. It, it. Yeah, it's, it's logic from a wasteful, but uh, at the same time, if the kid is able to pick their own food, they wouldn't be wasteful by buying bad food. Ha, <laughs> that's a good point. Yeah. I, also think it shows this like misunderstanding about 
sensory issues because so. for me those sensory issues wouldn't be gone in the morning right like if i didn't want to eat the oysters for dinner i'm not suddenly going to be able to eat them it, if breakfast. anything it's if, if anything it's significantly worse because now it's aged 12 hours yeah i mean why would i want to eat bad food that's older and colder than it was when i first had it Right. I don't want that. I'm. I. I, I will never do that to my kid. Uh, and my son sometimes doesn't realize that he needs to eat. Uh, sometimes the only thing that he will like is a McDonald's Happy Meal, and sometimes he won't put on pants to go get the McDonald's Happy Meal. So we have to DoorDash, and he will say, "McDonald's dude, bring Happy Meal. McDonald's dude, bring Christmas fries. McDonald's dude, bring this." So I'm like, "All right, McDonald's dude, bring this," and he's he eats it, and then like. Sometimes uh, when he goes for a while without eating, I was like, no, we need to eat dinner. We need to eat lunch. We need to do this. And he doesn't feel hungry. I'll say, do you want a milkshake? And he'll, he's always down for a chocolate milkshake. But I say, well, belly needs food. You need to eat something. So then he'll choose McDonald's Happy Meal or he'll choose chips or he'll choose something. We've got a snack bin with like mm -hmm. graham crackers and vegetable Probably pouches. Probably safe and, foods. Exactly. Stuff that he will eat of his own accord that uh, is acceptable. And if he wants a milkshake, he has to eat something because Belly needs food, but he can choose what food he wants. And with the pouches, he gets enough vegetables. He gets, uh, you know, graham crackers. He gets protein with the chicken. He gets food. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, I'm not going to force him to eat liver or Brussels sprouts or nonsense like that because i'm not a monster yeah and we do have very high rate obviously we've talked a lot here about depression and anxiety yeah the, already these things are making me depressed and anxious the idea of being forced to eat something that feels like tiny elves are killing my face exactly. um so that's already hard but then we also have very high rates of eating disorders and yes disordered yes. eating in general um the, do you know about arfid yes yes uh, i i have i know several autistic people who were misdiagnosed with arfid because of interoceptive difficulties and because of sensory difficulties yeah so uh, like i think a lot of people know anorexia and bulimia but like there is eating disorders are so creatively varied and often the way that we try to control people that we would like to behave differently is with the health story. Yeah. So you have to eat, I don't know, eat the rainbow, eat the way Michelle Obama wants you to eat, eat uh, four square meals or whatever we're supposed to eat. I can't remember anymore. Um, but there is a right way to eat and wrong way to eat. And if you eat the right way, you will have health. This health correlation- Health achieved, yes. Yeah. This correlation is not a direct correlation. If you are worried about your child's health, like by all means, like identify what the health issue is and address that health issue. But there is not a direct correlation between what you eat and your health status. There are many, many factors. There are skinny people who, my, my dad had a partner who was, I don't know, a hundred pounds, maybe 120 pounds, but she was born with one kidney and drank like a sailor. So the That's amount- That's a hardworking kidney. Right, exactly. So the the there are many health issues you can't see. You cannot judge someone's health by their weight. You cannot judge someone's health by the fact that they eat pancakes for every meal. You yeah. do not know. You You do not know, I promise you. Yeah. So um, we've mentioned autistic children grow into autistic adults, which is Fancy surprising, how that happens. surprising yeah. for many people. But autistic adults um, often have their safe foods and they often have a same food that they are eating over and over and over again. But then they will also have guilt and shame around that, that they're not eating healthy enough, not eating right, embarrassed to go out to dinner, embarrassed to go to parties. 
And this is where the pathology of autism, I want to like separate out from the culture. The culture of autism is we pick a favorite food, like an ice cream sandwich, and we have it every day at the end of the night or a baked ruffle. And it's fun and celebratory. And it's my thing right now. And I'm going to have my thing until I have another thing. And there might be a dark period where I'm between things. And then in the autistic culture, I could talk to other autistic people and say, like, I fucking hate ice cream sandwiches now. What else do you, what are some of your same foods? What are some, what, what else can I try? And that's all part of the culture. The social anxiety that comes with being afraid to go to a restaurant or go out with friends or eat in front of people, yeah. that is the pathology. So you want to tease that out for us a little bit from your perspective? Uh, so there's so many people who have this and, and it's often misdiagnosed as social anxiety because they don't want to be caught in an unfamiliar situation with all this other sensory input around them where they're forced to eat for an audience mm-hmm. because they don't know if it's going to be good. They don't know if it's going to be bad. They don't know how it's going to go. There's a lot of other noise around. They can't concentrate on the food itself. And again, for us, because we because of the way our brain is connected our, our taste is influenced by our surroundings and we, we might not have the same experience as we would at home eating our favorite foods as we are out around other people. So there's a lot of people that won't eat around other people that won't eat out that, you know, want to uh, go out, find the food and bring it home to their cave and eat it in silence alone in their cave. They don't want to be judged by their food choices. There's a lot of people who unfortunately say, oh, no, I really want to order off the kids menu, but people will laugh at me. Right. Yeah, that is it's food, man. Or what me the... pretending the mum mums were really for my kid. Like, exactly. I can't tell you the number of times I've ordered off the kids menu and specifically told the server that it was for my child. Yeah. I'm like, it... he'll have the buttered noodles. And like that was a hundred percent for me. Yeah, yeah. And that's the thing, because I don't understand why why people are allowed to make judgments on that kind of stuff because it's really it's a really weird thing to pick on somebody about because I don't know. Okay, I'm, I'm giving you my theory on this. So listen, yeah. if we equate what someone eats with health, because like even though autistic people really want to control the environment, everybody, nobody wants to die. Like yeah. death is just like our existential crisis. Oh, yes. And so if we believe if I ate the Mediterranean diet, if I ate keto, if I had 33 Weight Watchers points a day, I don't know if that's the right number. Forgive me, Weight Watchers people. If I just eat right, a balanced meal, eat like Michelle Obama wants me to eat, have a garden in my backyard, then I will live a full natural life. Like, then I will not get hit by a bus. Then I will not have a brain aneurysm. Then my lungs will not explode. Like, magically, I'm going to live forever because I ate the food pyramid or whatever. So when we see, let's say, an autistic person who will only have, let's say, buttered noodles, and every time you see them, you're like, oh, they ordered buttered noodles again. That's weird. Now you feel like you need to judge them. So when you judge them and you're like, I'm concerned about your health. Should you have a few vegetables? Maybe we can sneak a little protein in there. That is about you. You have now equated what this human is eating with their health. So then you're equating what you eat with your health. And you're like, well, I guess I'm not going to die as soon as Sally is since she's having buttered noodles for every meal. So yeah. I think this is some weird existential shit where the judgment is really about my own fears and my need to analyze your food has a lot more to do with like my need to try and control the the, the Grim Reaper. Thanks for listening to the Autistic Culture Podcast. We'll be right back. When autistic people find a special interest, they go deep and have a lot of knowledge, even if they don't have that formal education background to go with it. If you want to capture your spin in a book, check out Angela's work at differencepress.com. Differencepress.com. And find out more about becoming an author and establishing your credibility with a book. I think you're going to hate me for this. It's a little bit of a guilty pleasure, but did you ever 
Did you watch Love on the Spectrum? I know you didn't. I actually did. <gasps> oh my I God. Did. I'm yeah. so glad. Did you watch it more like for anthropology? Like, did you, cause I actually like enjoyed I, it. I, I enjoyed the autistic people greatly. Uh, there, there was one, in fact, that I had a massive crush on because I, I thought that she was just a delightful person. Uh, I, I hated how they said, for instance, like, this is Matt. He enjoys sunsets. He enjoys the sounds of tubas. And he enjoys rainbows. He doesn't like social injustice and farting. And... <gasps> You yeah. did that so perfectly. Maybe that could be your job, yeah. just that voiceover. Yeah, yeah. And, and they have like the, the, the elephant dance song as people walk in. And there the is some and, weird like theater, infantilization because the thing that he, he likes or she likes, they would always pick some baby thing. Like she likes mermaids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's, uh, but there was like a couple on there that went so well together. I think that he was into, uh, buses or trains or something and she was into like recipe cards and they were such a good couple and i was like oh my god this is relationship goals these people get each other i and know i did yeah. so it's on yeah, the show yeah. i really like so um one of my spins is broadway musicals and abby from Love on the Spectrum, also likes Broadway musicals. Oh, very and nice. So, like, I really liked her. I felt like we were friends. And there are issues with the show. Um, but uh, so I followed her on TikTok. But her TikTok is her mom's TikTok. And occasionally it would bother me. But because I liked her and mostly it was like Abby singing The Little Mermaid or some shit. I was like, nice. oh, I'm visiting with my friend. I'm checking my friend's social media. Until... I had to ban Abby and mostly her mother from my social media because of the SpaghettiOs fiasco. There's a so, SpaghettiOs fiasco, you say? Yeah. SpaghettiOs is one of my safe foods, especially with the little hot dogs, not going to lie. And um, so Abby goes to the grocery store. She tells her mom she wants SpaghettiOs. And her mom says, presumably at, the grocery store that's unhealthy like her mom's like that's unhealthy you can't have uh, spaghettios it's processed that's unhealthy like the thing we were just talking about abby goes home she makes the spaghettios and her mother is going to force her to eat the spaghettios and she is abby is crying hysterically like losing her mind and her mom's like you wanted the spaghettios you're gonna eat every last spaghettio have all the spaghettios and she's going, I can't, they're unhealthy because her mom put the fucking earworm. So now she's got her mom's voice repeating in her head. It's unhealthy. So every bite, she feels like she's killing herself. You'll be fine. Eat the fucking spaghetti. Uh -huh. I promise you. So, and then her mom films this and puts this on TikTok. Yeah, the, I I cannot stand when holistic parents of autistic ch children of any age do that weird shit to uh, try to get like have sympathy for me because of my autistic child's tendencies. Look at their tantrum, and that I fucking an autistic created. Adult. Right, exactly. That is that is inhuman. It was so hard to watch. Yes, it was very so much hard so. to watch. And the thing is, once you get, and I, I remember this for me as a vegetarian um, for, you know, almost 20 years, 18 years, it was just in my head. I could see the whole, I saw a thing. I'm not going to tell you because it'll be, I saw a thing. I never wanted to unsee the thing. And every time I was near meat, I had the whole thing. I did the thing. And I could see that in this video with Abby of her, like, it's unhealthy. It's unhealthy, but you have to eat it. But like, I can't. And my mom would be like, you have to have three bites or you can't get up from the table. Uh, but it was three bites of an animal. Yeah. Like, it's like, eat, eat a baby. Just to, uh, it's only three bites. Have you ever seen Okja? No. Oh. What's that? Uh, it, it is a sci-fi uh, story about uh, creating an accidentally sentient animal that uh, uh, food creators say is delicious and you should definitely eat them. But uh, then it causes all sorts of ethical concerns because, you know, Okja is uh, definitely sentient. 
So yeah, right. it's a uh, mm-hmm. yeah, it's one of those. It's a big reason why I don't eat pork because I feel sorry for all pigs. Yeah, because Charlotte's Web. Obviously. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm sure that's a okay. Anyway, not down. We're not going to go down no. that rabbit hole. Uh, autistic friend of the pod, Steve Jobs. Um, his we've talked about the Walter Isaacson biography before, uh, but he talked about Steve Jobs and food. So share this with us. Mm-hmm. In Steve Jobs, a biography written by Walter Isaacson, the author details Jobs' quote, occasional tendency to eat only one or two foods, like carrots or apples, for weeks at a time. Allegedly, Jobs also spent some time as a fruititarian, a subset of vegetarian that means eating only fruits, nuts, seeds, vegetables, and grains, absolutely no animal products. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's how that works. And you know what? You don't need to worry about Steve's health because he's eating carrots any more than you need to worry about Abby's health because she's eating SpaghettiOs. You do not know what her health is. You cannot make judgments based on what people eat. It is not, our bodies are not vending machines. There are many factors. Let people worry about their own health. You worry about yours, Chica. Yeah. Minding your own business is free. (laughs) Excellent. I love it. So- uh, culture in terms of how our food works. If you take out that pathology piece and we got to live in the land of autistica, like we are right now, um, we have an amazing culture of simplicity with food. Oh, yes. You talked about the bins of snacks that you had or buying cases of baked ruffles. I've got my weekly cases of Fiji water. We get things set up on auto delivery our life is pretty easy. Like if you think about how complex food culture is when you, there are families that make a different meal every night for a month. School. I can't imagine the folks. Yeah. It's so much work. It's, uh, I, I frequently say on Futurama, they have this thing called bachelor chow with all the nutrients that you need. It's essentially cereal. It's bachelor chow. Uh, and but that's the thing about the process complexity of cooking every single night and variety of food every single night. That's a lot of work, especially when you have spoons that you know. If you've ha- had a long day, if you've had mm-hmm. a lot of social interaction, if you've had a lot of sensory overload, we can't be shamed into saying we are deficit human beings because we are we are deficient human beings because we are not cooking quote a proper meal. I need one slice of Lando Lakes cheese on a p- small potato roll. That is my dinner. It is very easy. Y'all should try it. Yeah. I'm just well, saying our culture is a culture of simplicity. Christmas, everyone's yeah. freaking out. They're cooking for two days. People are fighting. There's too many people in the kitchen. You got a chicken nugget platter. Exactly. When I was in therapy, my therapist once criticized me for eating healthy choice meals because they are processed. And I'm like, well, here's the thing, lady. I'm depressed. I'm anxious. I need food. This is a healthy choice with vegetables and sauce mm-hmm. and everything. It says it's healthy better. choice right on yeah, the box. I exactly. promise you it's fine. Yeah. Relax. And, and uh, by the way, very... Very popular among autistic people, lean cuisine, white mac and cheese. Oh, God, yes. That's some good stuff. Yes. (laughs) You're like, I'm on it. I was on it too. Yeah. Um, Okay. So we have it. Our food culture is a very simple culture that gives us time to focus on family and friends and fictional characters. Exactly. More time for our special interests, which is like what lights us up. And by the way, if your special interest is food, go for it. Make your shellac on toast or whatever it is you make. But that's because it's your special interest. So we don't have to spend all this time. We can focus on doing more of what we love. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Amy Schumer's husband is autistic and he's a chef and he makes all these fantastic meals. And uh, if that's your special interest, then your partner eats well. Yep. By the way, a lot of sommeliers are also um, autistic and they are also super tasters as part of what makes them great sommeliers. So there can be can be a crossover here. So second thing about food culture in autism, when you remove the pathology and stop calling us picky eaters, it is a culture of efficiency. Yes, it is very much so. A time saver. 
if you just know you're going to have an egg and cheese on a uh, tortilla wrap, you're just going to have that every morning. Super easy. Less time yeah. shopping, less time cooking. Um, and we are happy. It's not like a crapshoot. It's like if I've got my safe food 100% of the time, I'm going to be happy unless it's a hyperfixation food I just finished with. But uh, I'm going to be super happy. You guys, you guys, allistics, you just eat. You don't even know if you're going to like it. That's super efficient. That's a crapshoot at best, man. I don't I don't get that. Yeah. Um, so quiet eating. So a lot of food culture is about going out, going to parties, going to restaurants. And for us, we tend to eat alone and you know, sort of quickly. We're gonna have a whatever egg and cheese sandwich. We're gonna have buttered noodles. It's not, we don't need to spend a hundred dollars and go to a party or go to a restaurant or something like that. And that means for all of you concerned about our health, most when you take out the pathology from autistic food culture, we eat slower. Mm -hmm. We eat what we like and we're more likely to stop when we're full. We chew more, we swallow more. We don't wanna be talking. We don't wanna hear you eating. That's a whole nother episode. Uh, we don't need loud voices. We don't want to like hold a plate. I am way too clumsy to like hold a plate, hold a glass, stand up, talk to people and eat. That's just not going to happen. It's not happening. No, no. There, yeah. So we have a culture of quiet eating where we're digesting better. And again, take out the pathology in many ways, this is much closer to the healthy ways you're trying to get back to with your caveman diets, cyclical eating. We're going to eat until we're sick of something. We're going to listen to our bodies when you stop telling us our bodies are wrong. It is a culture of connection that prioritizes our special interests and things that matter to us over cooking, unless, of course cooking is our special interest. So to wrap up this episode, I have possibly the craziest, most surprising plot twist. This is a quote I'm going to have you read, and then we will talk about who said it, because I believe it captures autistic food culture perfectly. Here you go. We should be eating a hamburger on a conference table and we should make better deals with China and others and forget the state dinners. That's uh, interesting. Who said huh. it? That's a very good question. I have no idea. Okay. Can you see the autistic food culture in there? Unpathologized autistic yeah, food culture. Just, just flat out uh, plain. Uh, yeah. We, we Just cut out all the pomp and circumstance and uh, because the the state dinners are unnecessary just focus on the deal itself rather than the food and all the other nonsense yeah he's like we should eat a hamburger at a conference table yeah with or without china there then we should focus on like making the deal with china and not these weird fancy state dinners is that bernie not bernie who is it I think it's an autistic person. Oh, definitely. It is somebody we know who has an autistic child who was recently uh, president of the United States. Ah, uh, yes, Trump. He definitely does have an autistic son. That's interesting. Yeah. Listen. He, he does love his hamburgers. He does. So he regularly posted pictures of himself eating fast food, overcooked steaks. He had one specific way he wanted his steaks, which was, you know, foodies didn't like it, but it obviously was a safe food for him. It was probably a safe food because he didn't want to see his food bleed, which is a very common thing among autistic people. Uh, Diet Cokes, KFCs, Big Macs. He had a very small, but probably has, small set of food that he ate. He ate at the exact same table in his hotel, almost every night. He didn't really eat at the White House. 
He had a very specific way that he liked his Diet Coke, a very specific glass, a very specific way his burger was cooked, and he always had it with extra crispy fried uh, French fries. Extra crispy. That's a very interesting textural thing. He wanted the crunch. Yeah. It was all very specific. Overcooked, like rubbery overcooked steak. People used to freak out. Diet Coke didn't drink, which by the way, most autistics... Again, it's a one or the other thing, but most autistics who like bland food also don't tend to like alcohol. So there is an addiction thing. There's a whole, there are many other things, but lots of autistic people don't drink. He makes a big deal about not drinking like it's a virtue. Interesting. That's my plot twist, yeah. Matt. Yeah, I, I think that's another uh, case of a stop clock is right twice a day thing because... I, I, I'm down with, uh, some of that, but God, I, uh, a, a rubbery steak. Oh God, that horrifies me. Right. But you know, whatever your thing is, that's, you know, that's your thing. So very much so when you take out the pathology, it becomes very obvious that autistic food culture has a lot of benefits and honestly, things like state dinners, parties, spending $500 on a meal in Norway. Like these things are part of an holistic food culture that has, I'm sure, plenty of pros and cons, but just as many as autistic food culture. So I want to end with one last quote from you. This is from C.L. Lynch, who wrote this on Neuroplastic. When you are autistic, you spend much of your life feeling very alone. No one can understand why you're melting down because someone brought old Dutch brand chips instead of ruffles. Yeah. People get impatient with you when you refuse to touch your shoelaces to tie them. Been there. Uh, I now wear shoelaces I don't have to tie. Uh, No one else in the room seems to be bothered by the two clocks ticking out of sync with each other. Good God. No Mm. one else knows you... uh, No no one else you know cares about cats quite as much as you do. Does anyone? Everyone says you are wrong. Things aren't the way you interpret them. Your feelings are ridiculous. Your priorities are incomprehensible to people. Stop it. Get over it. And why can't you are refrains that will follow you your whole life until one day you find a whole world of people who understand. And that world is autistica. Oh, yeah. Thank you guys for hanging out with, uh, with us in Autistica today. Matt. Let's bring this show home with a story from you on your favorite thing about being autistic this week. I look very much forward to a class I'm doing uh, tonight, uh, teaching more people about sensory sensitivities and interoceptive difficulties and giving examples from popular media about how uh, holistic people can better understand us. And I think it's going to be really fun. So, uh, yeah. Uh, I, if uh, any of you want to join us at this point, you'll have to watch the repeat, but it will be up. And yes, uh, we will put the than- links up in the show notes. And um, yeah, keep 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 spreading the word, welcoming people into Autistica. If you listen to any of this and it made some sense, we welcome you. There is a whole world of people over here who understand you. So thanks, Absolutely. everyone. See ya. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Autistic Culture Podcast. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. And remember, no one ever changed the world by being like everyone else. You can find out more about writing your book with me at differencepress.com. That's difference, D-I-F-F-E-R-E-N-C-E, press, P-R-E-S-S, dot com. Or getting a psychological evaluation or consult with me at www.mattlowrylpp.com. That's M-A-T-T, Matt Lowry, L-O-W-R-Y, L-P-P, as in Licensed Psychological Practitioner.com.